podcast about family, who we were then, who we are now, and who we are becoming. My dad was born in 1940, and times back then were different in a lot of ways. And my mother said, you better put that gun down. If you shoot me, I'm going to spank you like you've never been spanked before. And then again, not that different at all. Still picture us walking down the street, looking at the windows, looking at those travel brochures, looking at the diamonds and the little coffee shop and all that, and uh, something I'll never forget. My dad is a geologist, and I grew up on stories of his early career, about riding elephants to work in Thailand, mine collapses, and how a Polaroid camera saved his life. I know these stories by heart, but it's time to share them with my own kids. Let's see what they have to say. Okay, this is in Thailand. This time, we had to go to the northwest corner of Thailand. Forget what the, the Golden Triangle it was called in those days. This is where opium was grown. And this was a, a major world opium growing area. And this is on the Thai Burmese Laotian border area. This geologist had flown over this area and he told us about all of the tungsten. He saw this huge vein there that he saw from the air. He didn't have any pictures of it. And there were three of them. And that uh, there were people that were doing a little bit of mining on them. These are called ricin deposits. And there should be incredible quantities of tin and tungsten there. But mainly it was the big quartz veins because they're the richest kind of all. So, okay, we're going to go there. So it would be Frank Tolmans. Uh, he is a, the young Australian geologist that we have, and he and I and a Thai geologist are going to go there. I think we had one or two Thai geologists with us, one for each of us. I think we took a bus to a town called Kanchanaburi, if I remember. And then there we took taxis to this little town that was on the River Kwai. Now, if you ever study World War II, that was where the British soldiers built a bridge over the River Kwai. It's a very historic movie and all this sort of stuff. Okay, so that night we had to spend the night there before we could get a boat to go in the morning. We had this tent hotel, and there were these Thai people that came up to me, these young guys, and they kept speaking to me in Thai. I said, I don't understand what you're saying. Well, I finally got the the message that they were pimping for a prostitute and they wanted to know if she could come in. Go, no, you can't come in. So that's how it was going to start. Well, the next morning we had all our supplies and we had a cart, hand carts that somebody pushed along. And we went to the river and we were going to catch these dugout canoes. And what they are, they're long wooden canoes and they have a Volvo engine on it, a car engine. And they have this real long shaft coming out with a prop on it and it's balanced on a pivot that's at the back of the boat, which is surprising that the boat never flips over. In fact, it should flip over. Well, anyway, so whenever they drive it, what they do is they start up the engine and they put this prop into the water with this long shaft. And if they happen to hit trees or stuff like that, the prop just comes up and doesn't destroy the engine. So if you ever look at some of the Thai river boats on the internet, maybe you'll see what they look like. Well, we went there and there was a guy I wanted to rent the boat from. And through the translator, he says, well, no, I won't rent the boat to all of you. I'm going to pick up passengers along the way. And I says, no, I want the boat to ourselves. I don't want any other passengers on there. Well, he refused to do it, and I'm the only one here. Well, you go ahead. I'm not going to do that. Surely going to be another boat come along. So he had the people with him, and he had some monks and all these here, and had some kind of luggage that had real odd colors to it, something that I would recognize if I ever saw it again. So he went on ahead. This is on the, oh, before we got to that village, I have to tell you about that, where the, the uh, riverboat was, was there was a train there. And that was the original track that was laid down by the people who did the bridge over River Kwai. Now, the bridge itself was rebuilt. It had a steel structure on it now. And what they had was a steam locomotive that burned wood that would go to the end of where the rail line was still surviving from World War II. So that was kind of interesting, with big steam, and it was just, I was going to get near the window, but trouble is all the centers and all that would come out and burning your clothes and burning everything else. So I kind of got inside, and we crossed over the River Kwai, and we were going down, and I looked out ahead, window, and it was this rickety track, and it was like 15 feet above the river's edge, and it was along the edge of a cliff, and it was just timbers with the railroad track on it. Holy mackerel! That was built in World War II, and they're still using it. 
Now, this was just principally a passenger train with some flat cars that had supplies on it. And I noticed as we approached this trestle that everybody got out of their seats and went to the door. And I thought, why is that? Well, what they thought was going to happen was that at any time one of these trips, the bridge is going to collapse. And what they want to do is they want to jump out of the train before it falls into the river. So I did like everybody else. I went and found me a doorway and I sat there and had my hands on and had Frank. We did the same thing. We had other Thai people behind us because we were bigger, we were taller than the average Thai. And now we're waiting at the door, and here's all the charcoal and the steam, and the thing is, you know, going slowly over this thing, so not to go too fast on and cause the trestle to fall down. That was real scary. Well, we did finally get down to the town where we're going to meet the boats, so now I can return back to the boats. It was still about 9 o'clock in the morning, and another boat came, and I so through the Thai geologist, this was all going on, we could rent the entire boat. So the other boat had taken off an hour before us. So we put all our supplies in it, and we will be in this boat for about six to eight hours. So we're talking about all day going in. We're going 20, 30 miles an hour on this thing, but it's a real windy river. And at that time, it was a rainy season, and the river was full. It looked like, to me, a normal river. Well, I would, just to make another story, I would go down that river a second time, and the river was 90 feet lower. It was going through these gigantic canyons. So during the rainy season, this river would actually rise up 90 feet. And there was a lot of rapids and little kind of things that you had to worry about. Well, we were gone about two hours on this boat, and I noticed, oh my God, there's bodies floating there. And what happened, the boat that the guy wouldn't rent to us had collided with something and it overturned and all the people apparently, um, all the ones that we saw, were dead and they were floating down the river along with the boat and with their suitcases and everything else floating down there. So I said something to the driver, said, that's their problem. We just went on. So I was really glad that we got our boat that we did. Quite a bit to unpack here. Quite a bit to unpack here. Bronwyn, you've been to Thailand. Do you know what boats he's talking about? Do you remember getting on those river boats? Sort of. Sort of. They were kind of... They're narrow, right? Yeah. We did the narrow boats and we went And they're, to... they're very skinny so they can get through the little rocks. Yeah, we did We did the floating markets. Yeah. Remember on this little... And everyone kept trying to give us like ice cream, but we couldn't take it because it was no way sanitary. Yeah. <laughs> Your mama said no to that. We said, we'll get you something later, sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. You never got me something later. Eh, I got you something later eventually. <laughs> we went to Dairy Queen when we got home. I think the most interesting thing was the story regarding the, the train bridge that was apparently known for its ricketiness <laughs> and enough that whenever you went across it, everyone just knew that you stand by the door so that, you know, you can jump out in case it falls. Um, and the fact that that was just such a, you know, everyday kind of thing is a bit strange to me. <laughs> Yeah. I've actually got some pictures of it I can post it, uh, but I can show you guys and I can post it online. He's actually got some pictures, and it's a bridge kind of up against a cliffside. It's pretty something else. It's just a wooden trussle, trussle, trussle thingy, bridge thingy. Truffle! <laughs> Not a truffle, that's a plant, plant, <laughs> fungus that you eat if you're fancy. Uh, yes. <laughs> I like the story of he was like, oh yeah, there are just some dead bodies, and they're like, well, sucks to be them, let's go on. Yeah, that's going to be a theme as <laughs> we listen to the story. This is actually a story that we're breaking into two separate podcasts, so um, there's there's enough to this one story, this one trip, that's going to break out into two different like sets of like two different entire episodes. Something I hadn't thought about was the idea that when you're on a steam train, steam engine, that the cinders fly out and burn you if you're sitting by the windows. For some reason, that had never occurred to me. Uh, I thought that the cinders were ejected upwards. Yeah, but they come up and then they come back toward the they, train. Yeah, but yeah, they're up, but they're, the but they're above, above the train. The train, and, and then it's they... a floating... Yeah, mass, and right? they probably fall, maybe? No, I don't, they don't know the composition of steam train exhausts, so I can't <laughs> tell you. I don't look it up. That's not, it's not look upable. 
Yes, it is. All things are look upable. Um. It depends on how accurate you want your results. Does train engine steam? Does train engine steam? <laughs> does burn <laughs> you sitting next to a window? What kind of a question is that? <laughs> does train engine steam burn you if you sitting next to window? <laughs> well, does it, darling? Um. Do you know Wait, how okay. to read? The the chimney smokestack or stack in American or Canadian English is a part of a steam locomotive, which the <clears throat> I can't read this. It just defined a chimney. Oh, it just de- <laughs> <laughs> It's about the response I expected. Shut up! <laughs> I have no idea. It's not giving me anything. Well, I'm gonna trust the source that we have been provided with. What what was the source your father? Yes. <laughs> That's not a very like good source. Well, I think this entire podcast is dedicated on the idea that at least a somewhat reliable source. I mean, mm. we could turn it into a fascinating play on the concept of an unreliable narrator. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes on you! Everything we came up, this was all just BS. Yeah, remember that ball that they made at pig intestines that they would throw at people and kill That's each other? That's just called a normal football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, let's see what's coming up next. Okay, here we go. Well, around 12.30 or so, we came to this floating village. And what it is, it was a uh, houses that were on huge, thick piles of bamboo. And they would tie the bamboo together, and this village, they literally lived on the river. What they would do is they would catch fish, and they had restaurants there, and I think even sleeping quarters, hum- hammocks, for travelers that went up and down the river during this time. Surprisingly, it was there during the dry season also. So anyway, we come there to eat, and of course, I'm going to eat only the cooked stuff. At that time, I loved red fantas, they were called. I called them Viet Cong Fanta, and all the people would laugh when I was because I couldn't remember how to say red in uh, Siamese. While we were there, I was eating. They brought me the Fanta, and they want ice. No, I don't want any ice. I'm just going to drink it hot. Well, Frank insisted that he have ice. I think Frank, you shouldn't do that. And I couldn't think of the reason why because I come wondering, where does the ice come from? Well, after he had drank it, I said, Frank, come over here, look what they do with the ice. What they were doing now, they got the crappers right there on the boat, so you poop right into the river, you urinate right in the river, got all the other stuff in the river, and what they would do, they'd have the box of ice, and they'd have a sawdust on it, so they would rinse it off in that river. (laughs) Of course, Frank almost died right there. He knew he was going to die from diseases, and it turned out that he got lucky, and his system digested whatever there was, and he didn't get sick, but boy, was he really worried about it. Well, anyway, I ate the food. I did okay. We keep going up there, and it's getting close to dark, and we finally get to the village where we're supposed to stop, and then from there, we're going to go to the mine areas. Well, we get there about dark, and there's a wooden house, and we are to sleep on the upstairs of the it is just bare floors. So we had our bedrolls with us, and because there would be mosquitoes around, had mosquito netting to go around. So we went and set up our beds, and we came down to go eat. Well, now this village did not have any electricity, because it was so far out and everywhere. So what they used, they used Coleman lanterns as lights. So we got to go eat, and we found a, quote, a restaurant, quote, unquote. And the tables were made out of gigantic logs that were sewed, you know, that were sawed about the height of a table. And then the chairs were little logs that we sat in. So we went ahead and ordered some food. Of course, it was Thai food, some kind of noodles, or what they had was cow pot, they called it, which was fried rice. had eggs in it and some kind of meat and vegetables and kind of spicy, and I I really did like it. Well, as we're eating, I look up the street there, and there are three people walking toward us. And I said, golly, Frank, this, look, those those are Anglos there. They look like white people. And sure enough, they were. Now, we're way in the middle of nowhere in Thailand, way up the River Kwai, this little tiny village. And here are these three people. And it was a man and two women. And as they got closer to them, I said hello to them. And oh, they were surprised. And they came there in time. Well, what they were, they were missionaries. He was a doctor and the two of them were nurses. And what they were doing, they were sneaking over the Burmese border, which where we were going to go also. And they were working with the uh, tribe that's called the Karans. The Karens, I think the Karens. 
the Burmese army at that time uh, was at war with the Karens. So what they did is they lived there on the edge of the border with Thailand, and then they, they also raised opium because that's the only kind of way that they could make any money. So I was just absolutely shocked. And it turns out they were from Houston, of all things. And they had been there about 12 years, and they, they were also missionaries. So I asked them, I said, wow, with the Karens that you're with, they're Christians, but in Thailand, do you missionary work there? He says, oh, yeah, we do a lot of missionary work here in Thailand because I'm a doctor and nurses and all that. I said, I'm really surprised because these people are pretty devout Buddhist. How many people have you converted to Christianity? He said, oh, probably less than one. So he knew that it was a, a, a losing situation. So that was really amazing out in the middle of nowhere, uh, sitting on these wooden logs along the River Kwai to meet three people from Texas. when we were listening because you didn't understand the reference to Viet Cong Fanta. So it took me a second because I couldn't hear him right because he said Fanta. Fanta. And so I'm like, what is Fanta? Is, what is Fanta? Fanta is Fanta. Fanta. The, the, well, like, the, the, the drink. The drink. Yeah. Like the orange drink. In this drink. random town in the middle of... Yeah. It's not a town. It's a, it's a floating it's a, river it's a floating society. River yes, it's a Fanta. So they were drinking Fanta. And, and Daddy wanted a red Fanta, and he couldn't remember the word for red, so he called it Viet Cong because they're communist. And so then they were like, ha, ha, ha. So Viet Cong Fanta is red Fanta. It's, it's a joke. That's pretty funny. Funny it's joke. It's super funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Thai people thought it was funny back in the 70s. Well, this sure was in the 70s? This is, yes. This, all of these stories are before I was born. We were in Thailand recently, and we did kind of the same thing, right? Of like, only eat stuff that is cooked. And really? even like with the fruit, and we were just kind of like worried and like don't necessarily get the ice. And... I remember we were on like that floating market, or it was some kind of... Little, it might have been the train market, mm -hmm. and they had offered us like fruit, but there were flies around the fruit, and we were like, "No, yeah, why would we want to eat this? There's literally flies on it. Well, how are you selling this?" And then we saw this woman in the train market, literally just chopping heads off of fish. Yeah, like, she actually, live she fish. Was, like, yeah, she would, like, beat them for a minute and then chop their heads off. <laughs> yeah, she had a bucket <laughs> of, like, catfish or eels, maybe, and she Something would like pull them out of the bucket and she would bang them on the head to, like, stun them, and then she would cut their heads off <laughs> and throw them into two As they different... were still kind of, like, wiggling, she would <laughs> throw them away for someone to take the scales off. I like to think that my chicken nuggets just grow like that and are harvested off of a chicken nugget it's tree. even worse. <laughs> <laughs> like I said. <laughs> but th this is why you don't eat burgers. <laughs> This is why I like chicken nugget trees. But yeah, just seeing her like just hit this stupid thing and then chop the head off and over there and over here. And yeah, so whenever we traveled, thinking of these stories from my dad, we were really careful about the food that we ate off the street. We did do a street market tour though, guy, and the guy was like, I'm taking you to white people's safe food that your <laughs> stomachs can handle. Cause he's like, you know, I grew up here. I can handle like a lot of different things depending on how it's made. He was very nice about it, but he's like, your stomachs are used to this or not used to this. And I kind of know what you guys can eat and go home and not yeah. like barf all night. Do you remember yeah. um, when we were in Thailand, Erin was so mad cause her dad is part- Vietnamese. 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 And she was like, I want the white people food. I went, yes, because... Because everyone assumed, since we were in Thailand, she kind of looked Thai, so everyone assumed she was Thai and she could eat Thai food, but she couldn't because she didn't grow up in Thailand. And she always had to say, I want the white person food. And yeah. They would all look at her and just talk to her in Thai, and she could not understand a single thing. I think it's funny Dad never talks in these stories about the food being too spicy. Yeah. He's like, I like spice, but granted, he does eat jalapenos with his ice cream. Yeah, that's kind of true. I have a question. Is the reason that the food is so sketchy, is it because there's less public health codes or they're just not enforced? That sounds like a great question for Google, but I'm guessing <laughs> both. Okay. I'm that, guessing. Would, that would make sense to me as well. Well, I mean, and you can only enforce code as much as you have the infrastructure to support enforcement. 
So it's one thing to say you have to have fresh and clean water, but if you don't have the infrastructure in place to provide fresh and clean water, you can't really require kitchens to be spotless. And it's it's kind of hard to enforce a law on a floating city. Yes. As it's literally moving positions every Yell at day them from the shore. <laughs> yes. I mean, we have a hard enough trouble with food trucks, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine trying to get a food truck, but it can go on the ocean, on the water, and yes, you can just throw. Is known as a boat. (laughs) Shut your mouth. (laughs) Yeah, but these aren't boats; these are canoes. They're like big. They're long. Still a boat. All right. The next morning, what we're going to do is we're going to take. It's rainy season now. I'm here for rain all the time incredible downpours because it's a monsoon season. Although there's roads up there, the roads can only be used during the dry season. And there's rivers to be crossed and all this. So to do that, we're going to ride elephants. So I had an elephant and Frank had an elephant. And then we had a third elephant that carried all our supplies on us. So what it is, the elephant is a basket and it was like uh, on each side of the elephant. And on one side, put the counterweight of our food supply, because we needed three elephants to carry all our supplies. And then I had a basket where I sat in, and then Frank had one too. So here we are riding this elephant, and there is this Siamese guy that's sitting on the neck of the uh, elephant. What he does is he, he kind of jumps up and down the whole time, and that makes the elephant move forward. And then when he wants the elephant to stop, he takes the dull in the machete and hits it over the head. It makes a hollow sound. And a, holy mackerel. Every time you would do that, they would scream and they would hit their trunk in the ground and they would go around in a circle and he would think that that was funny and he would hit it again and watch it was funny and he thought, well, he's making the elephant dance. And I think, you know, what is going to keep that elephant reaching up with the trunk and taking this guy and throwing him off? So here we go. We go for hours. And finally, we're going up this one trail and it's way up uh, this hillside. Uh, what it is, you see nothing but round circles there. And they're about the size of wash tubs. Well, what in the world is that? Well, that's where the elephants stepped. Because the rainy season, they would be filled with water, they got mud in there, and otherwise they would slip down. So what we did is this, what I call pothole road, which is elephant footprint road. We went way up this mountain. And then finally, and again, it's raining, and we get uh, to this road. So we're going along this edge of this road, and that's a, a dirt road that's cut out from the edge of the mountain, and there was bamboo growing there. And the bamboo would grow on the outside of the road, you know, where the cliff was. We're talking about several hundred feet to maybe five to six hundred feet that'd be straight down there. And we'd look down and see the rivers going and all that. And would you know that the elephants would take all four feet, put them together in one spot, and take their trunk and reach way out over the road to get some of that bamboo to eat? And of course, with me in the basket, I'm looking down and I'm looking over the edge of the cliff. Holy mackerel, I want to jump off of this thing. I want to get off of it, but I couldn't. And then what happened, the guy would take the machete and he'd hit him, you know, the dull and on. And he'd hit it so hard that you could hear it ringing, the echo inside the elephant's brain, ringing through the hillside, the echo through the canyon. So that was really exciting. And then they decided to take a shortcut. So we're going up this hill and the elephant refuses to go. And all three of them, they just absolutely refuse to go. They keep pounding the elephants and pounding them and everything else, and they absolutely refuse to go. And they just go around circles, so they gave up. And we went down around, instead of going over the top of the hill, we went around the side of the hill. And the reason why the elephants wouldn't go there is the other side of the hill that the drivers didn't know was mined out, and it was like a big cliff there. And the elephant sensed that if they got too close to that, that the ground would cave in on them. They're not like horses would have walked literally over the edge of the cliff. So that was kind of a fun thing. I remember when we were going on like a tour, remember that final tour we did in Thailand? In Ayutthaya, Ayutthaya? Ayutthaya, yeah. (laughs) Where the ruins and we were driving past some elephants and we were like, Hey, maybe when we go come back from this tour around this temple. Yeah, we were going to a temple. And um, we were like, hey, well, maybe we could ride the elephants. And we were at dinner, not dinner, it was like lunch or something, at this really weird restaurant with like three tables in a 
giant porch that looked into the river for some reason. It was very pretty. Yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, we can't ride the elephant. I was like, we looked on Why? TripAdvisor. Mm-hmm. And they were like, because they were mistreating them. But, yeah, can you imagine hitting an elephant on the head so hard that it is hollow and... Sounds cartoonish. Yeah. It sounds awful. And, and so there are places now in Thailand where... Because um, there were a couple places where we were, and Kevin, you weren't there, where you could ride elephants, and the place that we were looking at was being described just like Dad is describing here, where they hit them, and the tourists who went and described it on TripAdvisor were like, we felt so bad after we went, it was horrific, the way that the people were treating the animals. But there are actually now sanctuaries in Thailand that are specifically looking to you know, raise awareness and take care of the elephants, and you can actually go to places in Thailand and like do an elephant vacation where they teach you how to take care of the elephants and treat them well and you know they get good care and stuff like that but yeah I mean apparently I mean so things are moving better in the right place and that made me feel better to know that whenever we went and we saw that there were places that you could do that because yeah so growing up I don't remember hearing the stories about them abusing the animals but I do remember the stories about them putting their four feet together and reaching over the chasm to reach bamboo and looking down and being like oh great I hope I won't die <laughs> one question what do the elephants like sleep like do they just keep on going because they never talked about stopping that's a really stupid question well I, I- <laughs> talk about stopping to give the elephants like food or water or a break mm-hmm. that's, that's hippie meant. crap that's probably punch true you in the face. no but he's probably right there probably wasn't a whole lot of care for the elephants welfare as long yeah, as they were what if the elephant passes out and you fall into a chasm well then it sounds like that's your problem according to the boat guy from the previous <laughs> <laughs> early one so yeah, I think we are from a time when human life has just a little bit more value. Yay. Human and animal life has more I, value. I was about to say, I think animals matter. Too. Yeah, humans and animals, like, we're just a little bit more, like... A little? Little? We're just a little bit more, you know, mm, soft tiny and tiny caring tiny around the edges. Animal. It's also because we can be. We have <laughs> developed technology to the point where we can be soft softer soft around the edges right my basic needs are taken care of so now i have time to worry about other people's basic needs yeah and their luxuries and their their comforts and stuff like that also, so i don't think at the time my the pop of Vernon was really worried about like how the animals are treated because if he's in the mountains what are you gonna do just get off and the elephant's just gonna go yeah without well, you? right i mean he's nothing you can do about it and now, remember, he's going toward the Burmese border where they're apparently... Oh, Burma. Burma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, going towards... I was confused because Bur- Burma's not Burma anymore. It's like Myanmar. Now. Myanmar, yeah. Whatever it is. I can spell it, can't say it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so they're going to that area where there's going to be growing a lot of opium and so there's going to be a lot of drugs going around. So, you know, he's not going to want to be by himself anyway. So even if you had a moral objection, you're just going to shut up and... And move on. Yeah. All right. Let's see what happens next. Well, they had told us they have plenty of food. You don't have to bring any food. Well, what they meant by food is they had rice. So we had rice wine, quote unquote, which was the water that was left over from boiling the rice. That was our drink. I took rain water and I had iodine tablets and I put in a canteen, that would be my drinking water. And they actually had, believe it or not, a lot of Fantas in this little village in here, which I bought, literally every one of them, for us. We had rice for breakfast, we had rice for lunch, and had rice for supper. Well, for the Siamese, that's the protein that they can live off. But Frank and I were having some major problems. We needed meat, because we're carnivores. And we were growing weaker and weaker as the, because we'd be there for about 10 days collecting samples and all this. So I finally told the guy, I said, look, we have to have some meat. So I gave him some money. He said he'll take care of it. So he went out there and you heard later, pow, pow, pow. He killed something and brought it in. It was a monkey, a gibbon. So that was our meat supply that 
We would cut that up and they would put it in the rice and we would have our protein that we needed. And as we were getting ready to go, they had a bunch of alcohol and beer and all that there, so we decided to have a party and I bought the beer for all the people that lived in the house and were our guests and our host and all of that. And I told them, look, I want to have a special food. And I had seen while we were going back and forth there, crabs, and they were land crabs. And I'll be down, you know what, I saw crabs just like that in Ingleside. And we're talking way out in the middle of nowhere. We're not talking about ocean crabs. These were actually land crabs. Now, I'm sure they had to go to the river to lay their eggs and their larvae and all that, but they were nice blue crabs. So I gave the guy 20 baht, which is equivalent to a dollar. I said, go and find us something that's really nice to eat. What I thought he was going to do, he was going to get us a bunch of crabs. Well, <laughs> he came back and he had this great big bucket full of black crickets. You know, the kind that you see going around the certain times of the year, you see them all around the light, gasoline pumps and everything else. What are you gonna do with those? Deep fry them. So they deep fried them and everybody was busy there eating on them. And so I did too, because I was so desperate for something else to eat. And you know, the only thing about it is that the legs would stick between your teeth, so here you are trying to pull out the cricket legs after you eat them. So then after that, I knew to tear the legs off before I would eat them. So at least that was something to eat, and they were deep fried, and we did okay on them. When we were sleeping there, now there was, remember it's a rainy season, it's raining, sometimes really bad. So we always had no screens, and there was no air conditioning, and we'd be sleeping in our bedrooms on the floor there. So everybody, it was just one big room was all it was. So we're all there sleeping on the floor in the bedrooms, and the mosquitoes were around. And so I would try to cover everything that I could except for my face. Maybe it was hot as crazy. And I would hear whoosh, and I'd feel a puff of air. What in the world was that? And then I did that for a couple of nights. So what I decided to do then was I'm going to have a flashlight that's going to turn on and see what's doing that. Well, you know what it was? It was bats and they were coming in and they were picking the mosquitoes off of us. Now, they weren't vampire bats, they were just insectivores. So that was a, after a while I got used to it, you know, I'd go to sleep and hear the whoosh and feed it around my arms and because my arms would come out because it'd be so hot. It comes around my legs because they'd come out of the bedroll because it was so hot. And then the bats, they were our mosquito protectors. So that was kind of weird having whoosh. Uh oh, there's another bat, it took another mosquito off of me. And they never did bite us. It's just amazing that they could come that close to actually pick a mosquito for us. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to point out what he said. He gave the guy a dollar and he came <laughs> back with food for 10 people. <laughs> well, uh, it was apparently that was the market rate. A dollar! Robin, do you remember being on the street markets in Thailand and Bangkok and seeing the fried crickets? Yeah. Do you know why we didn't eat them? Why? Because they had been sitting there for days. <laughs> also, they're crickets. <laughs> I mean, I've eaten snails and stuff before, but I'm, like... I'm so glad that I can just eat saltines <laughs> and white bread and survive somehow. Oh, yeah. survive no, somehow you would have somehow. died in Thailand. You would have absolutely died in Thailand. Yeah. We tried to order something. Remember when we were in the hotel and we had to order food? Oh, we tried to order food by looking at the picture. Uh -huh, by the picture of the food? Let's just say the soup arrived in bags. It, it came in bags. It was crazy, like plastic bags. And we had to put them in our own bowls. Yeah, like baggies, like like it, if you ever gotten fish from PetSmart, like baggies like that. Mm -hmm. like they were tied the same way. Like carnival fish bags. Like carnival fish bags. Yeah. The soup came in carnival fish bags, but not even like with oxygen in it, because you don't need oxygen because there's no fish in there. It was like completely full, and we were like, it won't be that hot. My dad tried it and literally started like coughing. Like even my dad was like, yeah, it's a little, it was a little much here. So the and food was really hot, but there was rice. I mean, rice I, everywhere. I, was, I ordered just rice because I wasn't that hungry, and I did not want to eat anything on that menu, <laughs> and I'm the only one who ate that night. I remember being there and eating a lot of rice and a lot of plain rice. I ate a lot of seaweed and rice. A lot of seaweed and rice. But that's one of my favorite things to say whenever I talk to people about, you know, how you can eat crickets and it's really good. You just have to remember to take the legs off of them before you eat them because the legs get stuck in your teeth. I use that like it's common knowledge just to make me sound cool. That's mm. very, 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 very hip cool. And cool and awesome. <laughs> mm. What did you think of the. Uh, 
What did you think of the bat story? I thought that sounded pretty much exactly right to what would have happened. I like it. it. It's... It seems very practical. It does seem very practical. I mean, if you if the bats eat, then you can just kill the bats and eat them. Like if the bats eat all the mosquitoes, why not just kill the bats? And the food eat them? chain in action. <laughs> I guess. But th- he never talked about them killing bats. That's true. They didn't talk about eating bats. No, but I feel like that would be really easy. Just like a stick out your hand and grab one by Instead, the neck. they ate monkeys or a gibbon. I was gonna say they seem harder to get, but also apparently it's somewhat easy. It's it's easy enough to get an entire basket of crickets that it's worth one dollar. So yeah. Well, I guess if they're yummy, you would have done it for free. That might have been it. He's like, if I'm going to get something and this guy's going to pay me, I might as well get something I'm going to want to eat. Let's get some crickets. Or you could just get the crabs. But I'm just saying, like, if you gave me a dollar, I would go buy Doritos because that's what I want anyway. Doritos are like three dollars. I know, but if I could go <laughs> harvest Doritos in Ooh. the forest, oh, I would. Yeah, get the Doritos. nacho cheese flavor, especially. It just my my favorite <laughs> nacho cheese. It just grows on te- trees. Yeah, they're right next to the the chicken nugget tree. So I actually want to um I wanted to ask about the because you talked about the Karens. Karens. The Karens that live in Myanmar. Remember he talked about the missionaries that oh, were living with the Karens. Yeah. I thought that was really interesting and that they're very, very, very persecuted. And I think you were just Googling Myanmar and learned about, like, it just, oh, yeah. first option was genocide. Yeah. Yeah. Option, but yeah. Yeah, right in there. And it so. It was like Myanmar coup, mm-hmm. Myanmar genocide, and Myanmar, like, pronunciation. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you look it up, this has just been like the the people who were there just their situation keeps getting worse and worse because of all kinds of, you know, religious weirdness. But I thought that was also interesting when he's like, all of these people are are Buddhist. How many have you converted? Probably around less than one. (laughs) So so this is what's going to set us up for the next podcast. So we are going to be in the jungle ready to go and everything that's coming up from here is going to be him going out and looking for rocks so this has been kind of coming out to the jungle we've started with you know prostitution and uh crickets crickets and and dead monkeys dead monkeys and animal abuse and questionable infrastructure and (laughs) dead floating bodies and 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 there's more to come death and disease lots of lots of death and disease and we learned about Viet Cong Fanta so we're making some progress the more you know all right thanks guys (laughs) oh my god I forgot that you're little what (laughs) what I'm gonna go hide now (laughs) (laughs) thanks for listening this was produced by clever fred studios our intro music is this is my town from slipstream special thanks as always to keevan and brunwyn for taking the time to listen to these stories again with me and of course thanks to my dad for taking the time to record them in the first place here's a sneak peek at what's coming up next time and I took some samples and I was looking at it and was kneeling down, wasn't paying much attention and I felt uneasy. Something's wrong here. And I looked up and here were the miners coming toward me and they had their machetes in their hands and they were hitting the palm of their hands with the flat part of the machetes. <laughs>